You are listening to audio from Citizens Church Elmira. You can find more resources and learn more about our church at citizensalmira.ca. Well, good morning again to everyone. If you're a guest here this morning, maybe this is your first Sunday or first of just a few Sundays, we're glad that you're joining us. My name is Darcy. I'm the pastor here at Citizens, one of the elders. And it is, like Harold said, it is a bit of a fresh start. Um, It's cold out there, you know, the leaves are starting to change. Maybe you started raking the lawn already, I don't know. Um, Getting things set for the cold weather that is coming. Kids are back in school. All this stuff is a bit of a fresh start. And normally at Citizens here, we preach through different books of the Bible. That's almost exclusively what we do. But a few times in the year, we'll take uh, a few Sundays to cover a topic or to cover a theme or something. And this fall, we're starting off with a series that is talking about the vision of our church. And part of the reason why we're doing that is because we are entering our fifth year as a church. We still call ourselves a church plant. I'm not sure when we lose that title, but we're, we're entering into the fifth year. Maybe this is the year where we stop calling ourselves a church plant. But... Five years ago, right around this time, a few of us, actually seven of us, were just sitting in a living room and we started thinking and talking about what we wanted to be a part of for the next, you know, season of our lives. And we talked about different things related to churches and how to do this, how to do that. But in the end, what we truly wanted was to find a place where we could just experience more of God. To find a place where we could love Him and worship Him and seek Him with all of our hearts. And over these four years and now entering into the fifth year, like many people have come along. All of you have come along in that process for whatever reason and under all kinds of different circumstances, you have found yourself here at Citizens. And I know from conversations that many of you have also come with a desire to experience more of God, to feel his presence in your life in a greater way, to meet him more regularly. And so this Sunday, we're starting a series titled More the foundations for why we exist as a church and, and what we're doing here, why we're either even, even gathered here together. And so let me start by reading a piece of poetry, actually, a poem that I read uh, just in the last couple of weeks called the, the Summer Day, which kind of feels like the wrong poem to read today, right? It's called The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. And maybe you've heard it before, maybe you haven't, but it goes something like this. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down? Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes? Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Now here she ends with these two questions. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? And then she asked this question, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What a question. What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? That's a good description of what life is, isn't it? It's wild and it's precious. And so the question that you should be asking this morning and Almost every Sunday that you come here is, why are we here? 
What are we gathering around this morning? If we only have one wild and precious life, what is it that we're doing here this morning? And to answer that question, we're going to look at John 10, this passage that we just heard read, where John is in the process in his gospel of leading us along to show us the reason, the why behind all that we do. And definitely the why behind the gathering that we experience here as God's people. A quick run through of John's gospel, I just put it up here for you to to kind of see, is that John is showing us who Jesus is. John, through different stories and through different events in the gospel, is showing us that Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is a better sacrifice. He is the new birth. He heals the sick. He is the bread of life. He fills us with all the deepest longings that we have. He is the water, the true light. And then in chapter 9, he gives sight to the blind. And now, here in John 10, the Apostle John comes again and he is calling us through this imagery to know and to recognize who is this Jesus? Who is the one who we are called to worship? And John wants us to answer this question. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? And he's calling us all along to answer that question, which, which lines up with why we're even here as a church. All summer, we've been going through our vision statement. So if you were here this summer, you would have heard it, you know, at least the weeks that you were here. And our vision statement starts this way. It says, Citizens Church exists to see people come to know and be changed by Jesus. That's why we gather here. That's why we do what we do. That's who we worship when we come together. And so Citizens Church as a collective, we have put all of our eggs in this basket that everything finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. All the the longings, all the desires that we have, all the hopes that we cling on to, nothing else will satisfy like Jesus. And so everything we do should be pointing us to the person of Jesus Christ, to his life to his death, and to his resurrection. And so here, in chapter 10, and if you have a Bible, if you haven't turned there already, we're going to look at this chapter, not all the details of it, but much of it, to see how it points us to Jesus as the center of our lives and the fulfillment of everything that we are hoping for. So John begins this chapter By showing us that Jesus is our shepherd. He is the one that we worship. Look at verse 1. He says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So John here uses the image of a sheep and a sheepfold, which would have been very common and understood for the local audience that was hearing this. I put a picture of one on here. It would have looked something like this. Maybe it was like a a rectangle or some sort of enclosed area where probably multiple families that were keeping sheep in a, in a similar place, would use that and they would put their sheep in there for the night or maybe if they were going away for a little while, multiple you know, families' sheep would be in there and they would maybe hire a hired hand to sit and even to sleep in the doorway. And so John is getting this image in their head saying, this is like what God is actually doing on the scene of this world. God has sheep, and there is a shepherd. So in in the context of this 
grouping here, a shepherd would come in and those sheep who he owned would come to him. He would call them and they would hear his voice and they would come near. And so here, John is saying, this is what it's like. Jesus is our good shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd that leads in a way where we want to come near him. We want to know him. He is our shepherd. And not only just a shepherd, but you see he qualifies it there. He is a good shepherd. In the text there, he is the one that we go to. Now throughout the scriptures, starting in the book of Genesis, we see that there is a narrative that is happening here where you have creation and you have fall and then you have redemption and you have restoration. That's basically the story of the Bible. And throughout this period of the Old Testament and even up to the time of Christ, there was this expectation. There was this hope that someone is coming, like God is working behind the scenes, and our Savior is coming. And so people would look with expectation and with hope, and there would be a longing that, okay, God is going to do this. God is going to bring the one, the Messiah, the Savior, who would solve our problem of sin and brokenness in this world, and he would bring peace and shalom. And when Jesus came onto the scene, People experience the Savior in their midst. And so still to this day, we worship our Savior, the one who fulfills all the prophecies, everything that God was pointing to, all the pictures, the metaphors, the imageries, they are all fulfilled in Jesus. But not only that, I mean, that's definitely connected to what the Bible tells and teaches, but also all the, the longings that people have, the things that people put their hope in. For some people, it's their work. For some people, it's the things that they can purchase. For some people, it's the, the dreams that they have in life or maybe all that they're hoping to accomplish. All of these things are connected to our deepest longings. And Jesus actually has come to solve that. But all of us feel this, um, maybe you'd call it an ache. All of us feel some sort of sense that we need more than just the things around us. I read an article this week titled, Awe, the New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. So there is a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley who has studied this and basically his book and his studies have drawn a conclusion that we as people need to experience awe in this world. And he says, it's just like vitamins or food or exercise. You need to have an experience of awe on a regular basis in your life. And if you don't, you will actually feel the effects of it. And so he lists eight things, eight ways to experience awe. And I won't go through them all, but he talks about experiencing the, the grandeur of nature and experiencing the wonder and the beauty in art. And he also talks about the experience of spirituality and knowing God. And he talks about experiencing life and death. He says, you need to have this, this awe experience in order to live, essentially. And this is tapping into the longings that all of us have, the desires we have for something deeper, more fuller, brighter colors, more experience in this world. Augustine wrote this in his book, Confessions, written over 1,600 years ago. He wrote, You stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So all of the, the desires and the hopes of God's people and all of the longings and the desires and the hopes of people, those who don't even know God yet, those longings are fulfilled in Jesus. They find their fullness in him. And here 
in John chapter 10, he says, it's the good shepherd. That's who we're looking for, the good shepherd. But there's someone else that's there. Did you see that in the, in the, in the verses? In verse 1, he says that there's actually a thief and a robber. There are other people. Jesus is not the only one that we are looking at, actually, in this world. There are other people who are striving to get our attention. They're striving to get us to see something else. In the context of this text, Jesus is actually directly addressing the religious leaders because they were satisfied with people just following religion. Just go to the temple. Just follow the laws. This whole like experiencing God and having your hopes and your longings, that's, that's unnecessary. Their drive, their focus was follow the rules. Be a part of religion. So let me ask you, 2,000 years on from this text, is that all you're hoping and longing for? Just more religion? Just more coming to missional family? Just more coming to church on a Sunday morning? Just more someone asking you to donate? Is that all, like just following the religious duties? That, that is not what Jesus is actually calling you to. He's calling you to more than that. To a fuller understanding of what this world can actually hold for us. And so the question this text is asking us 2,000 years later is, are you open to Jesus being your good shepherd? Are you ready to step into this world to follow him, Jesus, as our shepherd? In chapter, sorry, in chapter 10, verse 4, he goes on. Not only is Jesus the one we worship, he's the center, he is our good shepherd, but he is the one that we follow. Look at verse 4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep Follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Here, John says, this is actually the characteristic of someone who knows Jesus and who wants to follow him, is that they make him first in their life. They make Jesus primary for their life. So following Jesus is not something that they just do on the side. Following Jesus is not just something that they kind of, you know, I'm, I'm doing my life, but I'm going to include Jesus in on it. No, they actually follow him. He becomes primary for their lives. Jared Wilson puts it this way. Christian discipleship does mean following Jesus. It means following Jesus wherever he goes. It means lashing ourselves to him like a sailor in a storm-tossed boat might lash himself to the mast. It is a full-on dedication to following Jesus, realizing that he is the one whom we were made to worship and follow after. And so we're following him. We're making him primary in our lives. And, and this teaching that Jesus had about making himself first in all things was shocking in the day that he was teaching it, and it's still shocking for many of us today. That Jesus wants to be primary in all things. So throughout the Gospels, we see many stories where Jesus is contrasted with something else that seems primary. You think of the story of the rich young ruler, this young man who wanted to follow Jesus, but who had all kinds of money and everything associated with it. And Jesus says, I want to be primary. He says, give that up and follow me first. And he left discouraged. And at other times, people came to him and asked Jesus, hey, do you, you know, your parents, your mom's here, your brothers are here. Should I, do you want to go to them? And Jesus says, my priority is not my parents parents. It's not my brothers or sisters. My, prim my primary focus is God's work, the kingdom of God. Why is it that Jesus calls us to make him first? The reason is because all these things, everything else 
the, the things that we search after, even, even the closest family that we have, those things are all temporary. They come and they go. Maybe the most difficult part is that death ultimately separates us from all these things that we've been working towards and we know that none of it comes with us. And so Jesus calls us to something that is deeper, lasts longer, is fuller. And so what does this mean that we, you know, and some people say that it does mean this, but like do we sell everything and just, you know, go into a monastery? Is that, I'm not, you know, saying that you're going to do that, okay? I'm not even sure if there is a monastery around here. Okay, if you wanted to do that. Is that what this is calling us to do? No, the scriptures here are calling us to this to recognize that everything first flows through Jesus. The work that we do, the things that we have, the relationships that we have, all of those things are called first to go through Jesus. He is primary. So the work that we do, we do it well because we worship Jesus. The relationships that we have, we practice them as best as we can, because Jesus is shaping our lives. The things that we get to enjoy and be a part of and experience is because of Jesus, and we experience them through the lens of him. But maybe harder than that is that if there are things that actually pull us away from Jesus, if there are things that are getting in the way, that are making Jesus second third, or tenth down the line, the scriptures remind us to, to put into priority the relationship that we have with Jesus, that he's primary, that he's meant to be first in all things. And so it teaches us to order our lives rightly so that Jesus is primary. He is the focus of our lives. Then it says we discover what it is that God is doing. And that through that process, he is actually beginning to change our lives. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, Jesus goes on here and he says, the, the transformation that actually begins to happen when we make Jesus primary is that Jesus changes us from the inside out. Verse 9 says this, I am the door. So here he says, okay, not only is he the good shepherd, but now he's also the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. But I'm also the gate. He says, I am the way that you will find life that is flourishing. You see the, the description there or the, the metaphor continues that the sheep that are led by this shepherd are finding pasture. So they are living with abundance. They are living with nourishment. They are living under the protection of their shepherd. They are not thinking about all the other things that are going on around them because their shepherd is there. He is with them and they are secure in his midst. This is the image of us, those who follow Christ. Even though our world may be shaking and you may be nervous about where the economy is or where your family is at or where the world is at, all of these things may be going, but here we are. We get this image of when we're close to Jesus, we experience these things. Provision, nourishment, security. Because we experience them in Christ. He is our shepherd. And John shows us that the way that this actually happens, the way that we enter into this, is through Jesus' own sacrifice. He says the way that Jesus does this is by giving of himself. Unlike other religions that ask us to do these things, that ask us to meet the needs of these or that you know, opportunity or to follow these rules, here we have Jesus who gives of himself first. 
And so he is our good shepherd. And Romans chapter 12, Romans is probably the best description of the gospel. And in chapters 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul describes all that the gospel is, all that Jesus has done for us on the cross. And then he says, and this is the, the power that is working in you now to change your life. So in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then he says this in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, this is how you actually experience change in your life. Now all of us realize that our lives are not perfect. Our lives are far from perfect. But slowly God shapes us into the image of his son. And it comes through the cross through the gospel message, through the work that Jesus has accomplished for us. And so we experience this transforming power of Jesus. Then John kind of closes with this, this invitation that Jesus is for everyone. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 says this, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So here Jesus says, that there are other sheep out there. Now in the immediate context, Jesus is addressing the religious leaders and he's opening their eyes to this reality that was always true in the Old Testament, but that God was not solely after the nation of Israel. God's heart was for all the nations of the world. Israel was only meant to be this beacon, this light reflecting what does it look like to be a people who know their God. And now Jesus is saying, there are more sheep out there. There are other sheep. There are nations. There are people around the world who need to know that Jesus is the good shepherd and Jesus is the gate. Now that kind of flies in the face of our Canadian mentality of a privatized religion. You know, of a religion that is good for you in your home context, but don't kind of bring it into the public sphere. This summer we were on a, on a trip in Japan and then when we were coming back we were delayed because of a typhoon and so when it was actually time to fly home we were in line getting all of our tickets and all of us were in line who were you know the canceled people so we were all late okay so trying to figure out when we're going and where our seats are and so we were standing in line and there was uh, another person right there who was from Alberta, and we were chatting a little bit. And you know how conversation like that goes. You inevitably get to the point where they ask, what do you do for a living? What's your job, right? And I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a pastor, but it just brings a lot of awkwardness <laughs> into most conversations, okay? So I didn't lie, okay? I told him the truth. I said, I'm a pastor. And so he was like, hmm, okay, you know, <laughs> interesting. He was a professor at a university, so... We chatted a little bit more, and then he said something like this, and maybe, I don't know if I have the wording exactly right, but he, he, basically, he, asked, he asked us, he said, so what does your God have to say about situations like this? Said, okay, uh, you know, good question. Um, I have a sermon on that. You can listen to it. You know, no, I, I didn't say that. But basically, he's asking, you know, when difficulty come into your life, what does your God have to say about this? But what was interesting that's not the point of what I want to bring out here. What was interesting was that he said, your God. Like your, that thing that you do, right? Which is, the, is very Canadian and very Western. It's privatized religion. You do Jesus thing, that's great. They do, you know, Muhammad thing, that's great. 
They do secular Canadian things. That, that's the Canadian way. John is saying here that Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is the gate. And though we may not, it may run against our Canadian worldview, and it may even run against the narrative that we constantly hear here in Canada, but I want you to know God's word is going out around the world. People are following Jesus all around the world in maybe the most unexpected places. And I, I just had a, an email just uh, last week of some believers in West Africa asking again for permission to, to preach the gospel in this context. And it had this picture in it, which um, are some of the people that we used to actually live with and work among. And we presented the gospel there 20 years ago, and it's still bearing fruit to this day. And so the man in the middle there in the red is actually asking permission of all the local leaders again to, to preach the gospel in this village context one more time. And they were given the, the green light to do it. The message of Jesus Christ goes out. And people are coming to, to put their trust and their hope and find all their longings in Jesus Christ. It is not something that is disappearing from this world it is not something that is primarily just for Western white people. Okay, Do not believe those narratives. The message of Jesus is going around the world, is exploding in Africa, South America, and in Asia. People are finding their hope in Jesus Christ. And so here again, John calls us as his people, as the representative people of Jesus here on the planet, Will you share the message of Jesus with others? Will you tell people that you know, your neighbors, the people that you work with, the people that you play baseball with, people around you who don't know Jesus Christ, will you tell them that he is the gate? He is the thing that will fulfill their longings. The hopes that they have are found in Jesus Christ. John calls us, he reminds us that our hopes are connected to Jesus. And so my question to you today, and to end with this, is this. One, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you're here, and you've found yourself in here this morning, and you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ, I want to call you to trust in Jesus, to put your hope in him. If you have no idea what that means, you're in the right place, okay? That's why we all gather here, because most weeks we don't know what that means. And so we come back and we look at Jesus himself. What does it mean to trust and to hope in him? And if you are a Christian, like many of us are, and you've put your hope and your trust in him, this text is calling us again to put our hope in Jesus. The scriptures do not make you do something. We don't come in here and force you to do something. Jesus' work is an invitation. He invites you into something. And he says, what you will discover, here's what you'll discover, is that your life will be a life that is abundant, a life that is full, a life that finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The other week, I was um, listening to Corey Asbury. He's a, uh, he writes a lot of Christian songs. And his latest album called Pioneer is actually like a country album. And I don't listen to country music, okay? But it was like a country album. And so I was listening to a number of the songs. And I came to one of these songs where if you're a parent, it's one of those songs that if you're a weeper, it'll get you weeping, okay? It's one of those songs. It's called These Are the Days. And it'll just get you weeping because it talks about like looking back uh, different times in your life. So I wrote down a couple of the verses here just to give you a glimpse into what the song is singing about. It says this, hospital, hospital ride home was a four minute drive. The baby on board made it 35. We didn't sleep a wink that night, just laid by that crib singing nursery rhymes. The kindergarten drop off line his first day of school, didn't even cry. 
And that was when we knew that life, it had a funny way of just passing us by. Okay, this is where the tears start going, right, for the parents, okay? But then here's what the chorus says. It's, it's a call. It's a call to action. So the chorus says, and you got to kind of do this with a southern twang, which I'm not going to do, okay? But the chorus goes like this. So tell them bedtime stories. Give them a kiss goodnight. Darling, before you know it, this old house will be quiet. And I know we're tired right now. Someday we'll laugh about it, but let's slow it down and raise a glass because these are the days that we'll want back. And here's what he's saying. Parent, uncle, aunt, grandparent, don't wait. Don't wait because the days go by. And the reason why I'm quoting that song here today is because this is the message that John wants to open our eyes to. Don't wait. Follow Jesus today. Don't wait. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And your season of life will slowly slip by. And as one who is creeping close to 50 years of age, okay, I'm getting my way up there. Now I can say this, but so can Corey Asprey, a guy in his 30s, saying the years will slip by. The busyness of life will continue. Every season will have different moments where you'll say, ah, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Don't let this season slip by without saying, Jesus, I want you. I want to experience more of you. What will you do with this one wild and precious life? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this reminder. Thank you for John's gospel, for the way that it points us to Jesus, everything that we want to be about. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to do that today. Help us to take that one step forward to trust in you more, to hope in you more, to experience you in our lives so that we experience life to the full, life that is abundant. And Lord, for those who maybe have not put their hope and their trust in you, I pray that today would be the day that we would not wait, that we would take that step and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.